The main topic I want to speak about is the Irish War of Independence. The Irish War of Independence was a massive episode in Irish history. Rather surprisingly, many people in Ireland see the 1916 Rising, the Easter Rising, as more important. It wasn't. This was a very, very major event which transformed Irish history. Ireland had been part of the United Kingdom since 1801. But importantly, the majority of people, the vast majority of Catholics, opposed the Act of Union because they wanted either home rule, devolution, or a republic. There were various risings against British rule in the 19th century. Robert Emmett's rising in 1803, a rising in the 1840s, and the Fenians in the 1860s. Very, very significantly, these were largely symbolic. None of these risings seriously challenged British rule in Ireland. They didn't have enough support, and of course they were faced by just about the most powerful army in the world, the British army. And as a result, they didn't work. Despite everything that happened in the 19th century, most significantly the horror of the Irish famine in the 1840s and early 1850s, the majority of Irish people supported Home Rule, the Irish Parliamentary Party, mod mod moderate self-determination, mod moderate self-determination, devolution to Ireland. Supr this surprised many people and greatly disappointed Republicans. The belief of people who supported the Irish Parliamentary Party was that Home Rule was inevitable. There was a good reason for this. The vast majority of people in Ireland were Catholic, were nationalists and supported Home Rule. There was one problem with this analysis. Firstly, there was a question that nobody asked. What are we going to do about the Unionists in the North? Was no, there was no real tactic to convert these people. And secondly, there was the fact that um, the British state was divided. Yes, from the, from the 1880s, Gladstone and the Liberals supported Home Rule, but there was a very sizeable minority of British politicians, the Conservative Party most importantly, who opposed Home Rule. There were a number of Home Rule Bills, 1886 and 1893, and um, they were defeated. By 1914, it was quite clear that Britain was not going to carry through Home Rule. This greatly weakened the Irish Parliamentary Party's leader, John Redmond. The result of this was a drop in support for constitutional nationalism and a rise in support for, for physical force nationalism. This culminated in the 1916 rising in Easter. It always um, interests me that uh, on my regular trips to Dublin, I always take a walk around the, the GPO in the centre of Dublin, where you can see the, bu the, bullet, the bullet holes in, these, in, in the walls there, and people talk about it in a very reverential way. The 1916 Rising was symbolically very important, but it was symbolic. The British state was not challenged seriously at any time. The one person who understood this was Michael Collins. Collins regarded the Easter Rising as something, of course, he was glad to be part of because he liked rising against the British but concluded that in order to take on the British state, the idea of congregating in one of the biggest buildings in Dublin and waiting for the British army to attack you was military nonsense. If we're going to fight the British, we need to fight it using guerrilla warfare. I just say, I don't think he ever used the word guerrilla. In other words, we need to fight it not from a static position, 
but from a very mobile position. And when we fired our shots, we run away to fire the shots another day. This was not to everybody's liking. Eamon de Valera, the president of Sinn Féin, regarded this as almost unethical. If we're going to fight the British, we're going to have to fight them as a conventional army against another conventional army. This, of course, made no military sense whatsoever. If the IRA fought as a conventional army against the British state, it was going to lose. The other alternative was held by the other senior Republican, Arthur Griffith, who said, let's have a campaign of civil disobedience. The only problem was there was no evidence whatsoever that a campaign of civil, civil disobedience would work. By 1918, it was clear that public opinion in Ireland had been transformed. In the 1918 general election, Sinn Féin took 73 of the 105 seats in Ireland. An extraordinary achievement from a, 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 a very small base of support. They were unequivocally the biggest party in Ireland. They declared a republic and they believed quite, quite earnestly that this was the beginning and end of British rule. The British, of course, rejected this on the grounds that there was no way they were going to allow the complete severance of constitutional ties between Britain and Ireland. Once they had rejected this, it was clear that war of some kind was inevitable. The war that followed, the Irish War of Independence, was the first major guerrilla war in Europe. The, mo the model was the Boer War, which of course was in Africa rather than Europe, when um, the, the Boer forces took on the, the, the British state and achieved quite a lot. It transformed warfare, the Irish War of Independence. I was fascinated to find out that when, during the Vietnam War, Ho Chi Minh was, uh, was interviewed and he said, who are the figures in history that you most respect? And he immediately said Michael Collins. He said Michael Collins because he was re really impressed by the way that the IRA took on the British state in, in, in the war. On the same day as Doyle Aaron officially declared a republic, four members of the IRA killed two members of the Royal Irish Constabulary, the RIC. It was unauthorised by the Irish government, but it was hugely important. It said that there were people in Ireland who were prepared to take on the British state. It was the beginning of the violence. So who was involved in the, in the violence? Well, first and foremost, there was the IRA itself. Some historians say there was something in the region of 15,000 members of the IRA. Um, on paper that might be true, but every, every good um, analysis of the conflict suggests that only about 3,000 were actually in use, actually did the fighting. Secondly, there was the British Army. Now, very importantly, the British Army actually played a relatively small part in this. Remember, we are talking about 1919. Britain had just been through the most bloody war in its history. The idea of saying to the British Army, now go to Ireland and potentially fight, no. It's also the fact that uh, public opinion in Britain uh, had gradually turned against enthusiasm for warfare. They never actually opposed the, the war in large numbers, but there was hardly a family in Britain where, who hadn't lost someone in the Great War. And so, some were beginning to ask, what did they lose their, their, their lives for? So there was no enthusiasm for sending in the British Army. They did come in t at various times, but most of the day-to-day the day um, 
um, data connections between um, the British state and the Irish people was through the RIC, uh, the Royal Irish Constabulary and the Dublin Metro Metropolitan Police, um, who uh, were there in their thousands. Very importantly, outside Ulster, there were many thousands of police officers who were Catholics. Being a police officer was a standard job for many people. After all, Ireland was hardly a country uh, where there were lots of jobs and the joining the police force gave you a, a decent wage and gave you um, a level, a level of, of authority. As the conflict developed, being a Catholic in the police force became pretty unpleasant. Some were killed, but many, to use the word that had come from the Land League days, were boycotted. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't be served in shops, they wouldn't be welcomed in the local pubs. Members of their family were absolutely um, ashamed of them. And although there's not too much concrete evidence, the suggestion is that many resigned on the grounds that it was too difficult, or alternatively, got themselves a transfer to Britain. There were then the two auxiliary forces, one known as the, the Black and Tans, who were made up primarily of former, officer, uh, former British soldiers, who got a terrible reputation. According to Republican, and I think it is mythology, many of these people had been released from prison to join uh, the Black and Tans. And then there were the auxiliaries who were made up of uh, mainly British officers. The problem with these two forces was not that they both carried out, particularly the Black and Tans, some, some pretty grisly acts of violence, but they were there as a police force and didn't find policing very easy. It's one of those questions which many people have asked about the War of Independence, is whether support for the IRA increased as a result of the actions of the British state forces? The answer is almost certainly yes. The comparisons with the recent troubles in Northern Ireland are, are useful. Um, the IRA would not have become the force that it did become if it hadn't been for the actions of the British Army after 1969. Um, now the reason that, that, that this, this happened was because one of the things about guerrilla warfare is it's very difficult for the, the guerrilla force to fight successfully. It's also very difficult for the state forces to fight. You don't know who the enemy is. And the analysis by Eamon de Valera was something rather unpleasant about shooting someone and then running away. Well, the other problem is, who do you know? Who, 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 who was it that pulled the trigger? And the fact is, you just go into an area where it was known there was Republican support and arrest people or beat them up or even worse, shoot them um, as a reprisal. Well, the problem with this is you increase support for the guerrilla forces um, and um, that, that is certainly something that happened. In the course of the war, around 2,000 people died. Not huge numbers, but not irrelevant numbers. The IRA tactics were very clear-cut. They would go out, they would, have, they would shoot soldiers and police officers. They would also attack prominent individuals such as judges and others. They would burn down buildings like the police stations and they would then run away. Between the start of the war and the middle of 1920, there actually wasn't that much violence in comparison to what came later. What happened during this step period, which was actually far more significant, was the Irish government through Doyle Aaron becoming the de, de facto state in Ireland. Their actions were quite impressive. They started collecting taxes. They started policing, essentially 
taking over the functions of the British state. The pressure on the British state was building. The main targets for the IRA were the most visible people, the Royal Irish Constabulary and the Dublin Metropolitan Police. What made Collins's operation relatively successful was the fact that he had many, many spies. One of the problems that the British state had in Ireland is outside Ulster, the vast majority of people who were operating the state were Irish Catholics. The British state had no idea what the politics of these people were, but given the result of the 1918 election, they must have suspected that many of these people voted Sinn Féin, and even if they were not actually supporters of the armed conflict, um, they were not necessarily hostile to it. And the information that many of these people gave to Collins's uh, men, and it tended to be men rather than women, um, led to operations. Now the killings of people um, wasn't to everybody's liking in the, in, the, in, the, in the nationalist community. There would be a knock on the door, someone would come to the door, you suspected that, that this person was um, an officer in the British Army or the police or whatever, and you shot them dead. And uh, De Valera in particular was appalled, partly morally but mainly tactically, that the publicity that kill, killing someone often in, in front of their family would be counterproductive. Most significantly, there was the target of an organisation called the G-Men, who were the political threat intelligence part of the British Army, and they were killed in 1920. One other tactic uh, that was used by Republicans during this conflict was the hunger strike. Now, there's nothing particularly Irish about the hunger strike. It's essentially a statement that the people you've sent to prison are not criminals, they're soldiers. Now, it's a particularly difficult tactic to use. I, 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 I wrote some stuff about hunger strikes in the 1980s in Britain and spoke to some people who um, went on hunger strike and it was, it was very moving and very depressing. Uh, but one of the things that uh, one of them said to me was, you can't order someone to go on hunger strike. It's such a personal thing. And there are a lot, a lot of people who just said, I can't do it. Because the worst thing you can have in a hunger strike is someone starting on a hunger strike and then actually giving in because states inevitably will come in and say would you like a really nice meal and you know if, if you're starving that must be very very tempting the most famous hunger striker in the war of independence was Terence McSweeney who was the, the Lord Mayor of Cork he died on the 21st of November, 1920. It caused a massive response in terms of public opinion. And in response to this, the IRA killed 16 members of the armed forces. Not all of them were the right people. But it was a devastating blow for the British state. In response to this, the British Army was sent into Croke Park, the, um, the home of Gaelic, Gaelic sports in Ireland, and essentially they opened up on the crowd and indeed killed a GAA player, Michael Hogan. Later that day, two Republican prisoners were shot dead in prison. It was claimed they were escaping, but uh, I don't think anybody really believed that. This was a classic set of reprisals. Reprisals can have one of two effects. What they're trying to do is say, if you do this, we'll do that. 
but it is likely to radicalise the people so that they support the guerrillas, the terrorists, call them what you want. And it was clear that public opinion in Ireland was hardening. These events are referred to by Republicans as Bloody Sunday. A, new, a unique term in Ireland until the horrors of 30th of January 1972. Later that week, 17 auxiliaries were shot dead in Cork by Tom Barry's IRA unit. Ireland was at war. The Black and Tans burnt down Cork city centre. Between December 1920 In 1921, there were over a thousand deaths in Ireland. 24 IRA men were executed. By the middle of 1921, it was clear that the British state could not win this conflict militarily. As I say, and I repeat what I said earlier, one of the issues here was that the uh, British public opinion was increasingly saying we want an end to this. Not, not because they were sympathetic to Irish nationalism, they weren't. But because after the Great War they simply had had enough. And so a truce was agreed. The problem for the IRA is they were maximalists. Sinn Féin and the IRA I should say. They wanted a 32 county republic free of British influence. The fact was the British state wasn't going to give them that. Militarily they might have been quite, successfully, quite, quite, quite successful but they didn't have the military power to take on Ulster. <coughs> Whatever was to come out of the negotiations it wasn't going to be a 32 county republic. But what the War of Independence showed us that um, we had a new kind of warfare. And for the rest of the 20th century, fights against colonialism inevitably followed the Irish model. Britain had a, a huge empire. Those that opposed it, opposed it, opposed it using tactics not totally dissimilar to what the IRA had used in Ireland between 1919 and 21. What these conflicts tried to do was not to defeat the colonial power, but like Collins, to actually force the British into a situation where they gave up the will to, to govern. And this meant that by the 1970s, the British Empire, for a whole ra range of reasons, was largely a thing of the past. As I said, the tactics of the IRA changed the whole perception of modern warfare. The weakness of this was that they didn't have enough force, support, or whatever, to get what they really wanted. Britain was not going to disengage from Ireland. What ended up was a kind of compromise which exists to this very day with a partitioned Ireland. But let, let us not forget that what was achieved for Irish nationalism was in part a response to the IRA campaign and Sinn Féin's electoral victories. Thank you very much.